And the resistance to change is very obvious for anyone working with personal development, group development, organizational development, scientific development, whatever change is going on. Mm. It's always a part of the process which is resistance. Yeah. And that is a very good thing because and, and, and <coughs> I think it's easy to, to find some kind of reason for this, a meaning. Uh, it's, a, it's a great meaning in resistance because without resistance there's no change. It's just obedience and that doesn't create change. That's true. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Mind the Shift, a podcast about a shifting world and shifting minds. My name is Anders Bolling. Today we're going to talk about mind and spirit and psychology and the dynamic between the individual and the group and also about leadership uh, and um, uh, the creative process and what the relationship between the individual and the group means in the creative process. At least I think that's going to be some of the topics that we will touch on today. I also think that we'll dwell a bit on the concept of consciousness, and uh, which this podcast has talked about before, not least with uh, David Lorimer a few weeks ago, uh, and uh, the possible paradigm shift in science that will enable a wider and wiser view on what consciousness is and where it is. My guest today is Bo Adamfeldt. He's a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, a body psychotherapist, and a management consultant. He has worked with changed, change and development for decades on an individual level as well as on a group and organizational level. He's also an advisor to the Galileo Commission, whose leading figure, the mentioned David Lorimer, was on the show, as I said, some weeks ago. The Galileo Commission is about helping science to widen by spanning the border to spirituality. Bu has founded an institute called the Institute for Life and Work. His book about handling conflicts was named Leadership Book of the Year in Sweden in the early 90s. And he's also written a book about change and development, which is much used in Swedish corporations and organizations. And universities. And universities. And, and, and has been published in several editions. Welcome to the show, Bu. Thank you. And I also wrote a book about territories and leadership. I'm interested in this balance between our evolutionary history and our mind. Oh, yeah. So territories and... Yeah, yeah. It was the other part of it? Territories and... Leadership. And leadership. So, uh, what, uh, territories in what sense? It depends on the perspective. Okay. If it can be a knowledge territory. Yeah. People pr pr protect their territories at work, you know. and But... In, in the early days, many, many, many thousand years ago, it was, of course, geographical. It was yeah. regarding food and mating and things like that. Yeah. But we still carry the evolutionary luggage. Mm. So that was uh, this, that was your latest book? or was no, it no, no. Yeah, yeah, it was it my was, latest okay. book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the other ones have been published in several editions. So Yeah, yes. yes. I think the latest edition of this... this uh, Change as a state of being. Yeah, that was in 2013, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. So, um, well, tell us more about your background uh, and your professional journey. I mean, I, I know a little bit about you because I... I, I've seen that you're an advisor to this Galileo Commission, and I, I've read about you. And uh, I and wouldn't call myself an advisor, okay? Uh, because but I, I think uh, that's on the, you're on the list of advisors to the commission. Yeah, but they never ask me any question whatsoever. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but I was I was one of the first maybe who wrote who, who put my name beneath the, the, the manifest. I see. Which I do believe in. It's nothing to, do. but. Advisory, I think, is uh, too much. It's a bit of say. a stretch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, we have something in common, actually. We, we, you have a connection to a small uh, town in southern Sweden called Växjö, where yeah. I actually grew up. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you lived there for, you said, thir 30 years. 30 years, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's a connection we have <laughs> without knowing it before. Uh, but you seem to have left 
you you are a medical doctor uh, yeah. from the beginning, yeah. but you seem to have left medicine for psychiatry and psychology pretty early. Is that correct? Yeah, here in Sweden we have we have medical school and then two years of of internship, uh, somatically mostly, but three months is is psychiatry, and then I choose to specialize. <coughs> specialize in psychiatry, and mm. that took four and a half years, I think, at that time. So I'm a, I'm a registered uh, psychiatrist. psychiatrist for grown-ups, not children, grown-ups. Yeah. And did you feel that that was what you really wanted to do, and also psych- yeah, psychology? Yeah, I started to study yeah. medicine mm. to become a psychiatrist. I see. Yeah. But I was also interested in psychosomatics uh, okay. long before that, and consciousness yeah. also long, long before that. And in your practical work as a consultant uh, and also in your man- management books, you, you, st- you stress inner qualities. And um, in, in this book that is called Change as a State of Being, is it is that the right c- translation? Yeah, I think so. You touch on the big questions about life and death, uh, to some extent at least. And uh, th- there is something called humanistic psychology. The Bible is mentioned. I, I don't know if you m- also mentioned Carl Gustav Jung perhaps in the book. I'm sure I did. <laughs> sure, yes, remember. probably. <laughs> but and, and and you also mentioned before the interview here that there's a difference between Western and Eastern psychology perspectives. Yes. So yeah. which one would you say you adhere to, and what is the difference there? I'm not an excluding person. I'm an including person. So I don't. I'm not so interested in differences. <laughs> I'm more interested in what, what's common. I can sympathize common, with that, yeah. What's common. The common ground, I think, is very important. So I'm not against the materialistic uh, worldview at all. I, I like cars. Mm. I like to go with elevators to the 25th floor. Mm-hmm. I like bridges. Mm-hmm. You know, I like a lot of stuff from, yeah. from them. But I think it's not the whole picture. Of course not. So but Eastern psychological perspective, you mean there is a, would you say that, the, that there is an Eastern psychological tradition as well as an Eastern spiritual tradition? Yeah. I see Buddhism, for example, which has been interest, oh, one of my interests since I was a teenager, as a psychology more than a religion. And uh, uh, the big difference from a Western psychology, here it's very important to have a strong ego. Mm. You know, it's very good in materialistic society with competition and all that shit to mm-hmm. have a strong ego. Mm-hmm. In in the Eastern way of thinking, uh, it's it's not that good. You know, it's a dissolution of ego, and to to mm, not conquer, but to enter into another state of consciousness. And I've been a meditator for forty years or something. You meditate every day? No, no, no. No, no. As often as you as you can. Yeah, mm. yeah. But but uh, I mean, for many years I did every day, mm. and I had uh, uh, it was a period in Bekshi. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, I guess it's about twenty years ago. I asked myself, "Who am I?" You yeah. know, meditating. Who am I? Mm. And then different things came up. Mm. Who am I? Who am I? And finally, after I don't know how, how for how long, but I guess it took. A few years, um, <coughs> I came to the conclusion: all is one, and and um, uh, that was this inclusive uh, insight, which I understood as a young man, as a teenager. I had the same. I you had did? The, yeah, yeah. That's impressive because when you're a teenager, you're you're normally more focused on your ego, I think. It, but but when you're a young child, you often have that. Wholeness, holistic. Yeah, yeah. You. Well, I don't see an opposite in in the ego. I mean, in Buddhists, I think they have beautiful concepts. The relative self, you and I sitting here, talking to the camera through this microphone. Yeah. Our relative selves. When we go to psychotherapy, it's our Western psychotherapy. It's our relative selves. When we go to work, we are, it's our relative selves. So all in all, it's a very important part of us. Yes, <laughs> but that's not all of it, you know. And then they talk about the absolute self, and that is beyond words. And I can't, for example, when I came to that conclusion, mm. I guess it it's it was my absolute. I came into my absolute mm. self, and it's wordless. Yeah. It's 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 more like a. Uh, 
a body state than a, a cognitive state. Would you say it's the same thing as, as what some call the higher self? No, no. So the absolute self is something different. The higher self, you, you know, you're into religion, I okay. think. As I've heard about it yeah, since, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, 50 years or so. So no, no, it is, it, it's a state of being which is very particular. Mm. And I see it more like an evolutionary thing, uh, like that um, Australian professor. He's, he's a professor of philosophy, I think, but also... Peter Singer? No, 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 he's also a diver. A diver? Yeah. Okay. And he had written um, about uh, how he believes, I mean, science is a kind of belief, uh -huh. uh, his logic, at mm -hmm. least, how consciousness expanded is much more, according to my view, than the materialistic point of view, which consciousness is just by chance and has no meaning and mm. it's just bullshit, you mm. know. Mm. It doesn't exist mm. really. And uh, it, it comes from uh, chemical reactions behind the forehead. Hmm? That's all. There's a side effect. Yeah. And, and uh, we call that a phenomenon. And, and the, the personality, of course, doesn't exist. It's just... A, Not uh, in that view. No, no. So I think all that is bull. Mm. And um, th th there is something else definitely to yeah. it. And uh, in the West, we haven't... We, when we separated church uh, from science in, in, in the 17th and 18th century, mm. I think we lost the baby with the, with the bath water. Mm. And the baby in this case wasn't God or something like that because that's a cognitive construction mm. um, <clears throat> and part of religion. And uh, he's a judge and... Uh, you shouldn't fuck and you should masturbate and all that mm. stuff, mm. you know, mm. they've been talking about. Um, but what we lost was consciousness. Mm. And that was a great, great loss, which put us into a sidetrack of the, of the big knowledge road. I couldn't agree more, actually. But but I I and I, I you know I, one of my favorites on the materialistic side is Richard Dawkins, and I like him a lot because he's intelligent. He's, he's got lots of knowledge. Mm. He's funny. I mean, he's he's it's an but amusement. But then in, in his reasoning, he stops at at one point. He can't go further because then it he would go into the spiritual realm, which he wouldn't do. Well, I think he, he uh, mis uh, well, I haven't talked to him, but I think he mix up consciousness with religion, as many do, even on yeah. my side, so that's to speak. The big, that's the big problem. Our, the consciousness yeah. gang, yeah. to which I belong, lots of people believe it's the same thing. Mm. There are lots of religious people in that. And I love that you uh, say that, because uh, I, that's exactly what I say also. I think it's it's so frustrating that people mix the, those things up and they, 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 they start talking about uh, the Crusades and and all these bad things that have been done in the name of religion, both yeah, yeah, in the yeah, name of yeah, yeah. Islam and in the name of Christianity, which is, which is <coughs> something completely different. That's just materialistic. That's that's part of the world. <laughs> that's nothing yeah. to do with God or consciousness or the soul or anything. Oh, but uh, God was created by by religion the god the we, concept of god yeah, god concept. being outside of us yeah yeah so we have to do do certain things to 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 attain that realm because if you read for example the gospel of thomas there are there, there other words there are other ideas regarding father uh, and and our relationship to our consciousness mm. and and the the parts of of the old written down uh, gospels, mm. which is usually called, which the church hasn't changed. Mm. <laughs> you know, they give us another picture, which is which is much more closer to Buddhism, and much more closer to to uh, a, a true mindfulness. Do you think the Gnostics were more or less right? I, I know know very little about the Gnostics. Mm. The, the, I can't gno talk not the about Agnostics, them. but the gno the Gnostics that. The, the Gnostic tradition that was supposedly the the correct view that Jesus held and uh, that was squandered and and changed that when the church fathers 
church leaders sat down in Ni- Nicaea in yeah, 325. Yeah, they still do. And they still yes, do. and decided what was true and what yeah. was not. And, and all these drunks, uh, drunk monks who've been sitting there and, and rewriting the Bible, yeah. what did they do? How drunk were they? I mean, were they sober? Did they, did they really uh, think uh, deep? Uh, did that's, they meditate? <laughs> you know, Fascinating. Or, you know, they were saying, oh. oh, I don't like that. That changed that. We still do that Maybe in the, science. The problem is that they were drunk from... Th- they in law. We do, the, we do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And so did they. I mean, they were human beings. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's 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 really really tragic. But maybe we are go- coming well, getting ahead of ourselves, I guess. But but I'm not against the Bible, so to speak, because mm. it's it's a it's a part of our culture and and um, a, a part of our history, an important part of our history, of course, of course. A very important yeah. part of our history. I, I but I think it's fascinating to to try and find out what parts of the Bible or the, or the text that were written at that time have been omitted and obliterated and that are yeah, yeah. possible to find to to um, to uh, reclaim today yeah, yeah. some some uh, scientists some researchers claim that there, there are some texts that that, that you, we can find today that should have been there really and uh, probably yeah, yeah of course of course so um, if we listen to Greg it's Rayling, the same, for it's instance, the same with science yeah I mean that there was a d- Dutch professor during his first talk to the university when he got the job, he said, evidence-based and authoritarian biased, Mm -hmm. which means, okay, it's very popular with evidence-based and it's part of our culture Mm. to see can we we base things in evidence. Mm. However, that's not the whole university, Mm -hmm. (laughs) nor is it the whole scientific community there's something also called authoritarian structures yeah. which decide uh, what's wrong and what's what's not wrong and if you don't agree to that you can't get your exam you will not have the research money etc yeah you said just said go away from here you, you see know. you see that in a lot of uh, areas in science that's true in whole of society yeah, maybe that's the thing that we were talking here before the uh, the interview. I was talking with uh, Jens, who who runs this studio, <coughs> about uh, uh, you know fake news and all these things that that are happening now. What people are talking about and the possibility, or, or or the yeah, the possibility of of a of of an actual truth existing, a, a, a so-called zero point where which we would love to. Uh, come to because then we would see everything clearly. But I, I'm I'm not sure that we will ever get there in this world because there are so many perspectives on everything. So I, I mean, uh, speaking of this bias that is in science, that it's authoritarian ruled, um, and that also decides what is put in pub and published in scientific papers and what is not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So which sure. means that there, there there is a there is a, a bunch of other truths out there or other knowledge pieces of knowledge that will never reach the scientific papers and maybe not the mainstream media and all that. So yeah, yeah, always been like that. Yeah, always, and it, it's always been like you don't think it's it's particularly bad now. The, the no, 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 no. I, I think it's a part of of the human side of life, so to speak. Yeah. Our perception, for example, as a, we 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 uh, the scatomes, we don't see things. We see things that, uh, as we want them to be. Yeah. Uh, you know. So uh, no, I, I think it's been like that for. Interesting. Since yeah, we I'm left the, the sea. <laughs> 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 if if the fishes have the same problem, I can't tell you. But <laughs> they might have it. Dogs, for example, I know. I have a few dogs. They definitely have, have the another, same problem. Yeah, they have part of the same problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, back to Buddhism. I think it's interesting that you said uh, here that you consider that more... Uh, to be uh, m- more to be a f- philosophy than a religion or psychology than a religion. Uh, that, that's no, I, I mean it's just a matter of concepts. It's words. matter yeah because I words mean, words words Hamlet said. In Buddhism uh, for the, me it's psychology. Yeah okay. 
you could also, I guess, argue that it's a philosophy. It's as you say, it's just a yeah. matter Psychology of Psychology came out from philosophy. So. Oh yes. So it's, it's more or less the same thing. But I, I think it has a lot going for it, Buddhism, because it's it, talk, it doesn't talk about a, a god outside of us, but it talks about the wholeness and and the, this uh, concept that, that we 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 can all we can all merge in a way, and this is a. Uh, this material world is uh, basically an illusion uh, and I listened to the philosopher the former um, uh, now deceased philosopher British philosopher Alan Watts a lot and he was very much influenced by Eastern yeah, philosophy as you know yeah. so and he he talks about these things in a, in a <coughs> fascinating way you can listen to him in on podcasts and YouTube uh, but the thing is that these the countries in, in that part of the world that are where these philosophies, the, like Buddhism or Hinduism, originated, they, they're not. They don't seem to be very much wiser than than the Western countries. I mean, as an average, if you look at China or India or no. Thailand, how come? What's your explanation for that? We're all humans. We're basically humans, <laughs> with all the problems yeah. every human being has. Go into the loo, you have problems. Yeah. In love, you have problems. Regarding your children, you have problems. Your self-image, you have problems. You know, being human isn't easy. One of my first uh, supervisors said, who the hell said life is easy, Bo? (laughs) 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 Well, (laughs) that's what I wanted it to be when I was 26. But then maybe you would get bored. Probably, yeah, yeah. It's there are no part, challenges if no, it is. It's part of the human it experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want it to be too difficult, but a little bit tricky, I think. That's optimal, isn't it? I think it can be. Uh, I mean, as old as I am now, I think definitely it can be very difficult. And still, it's a part of the journey uh, of life. Yeah. Because, <clears throat> for example, during Corona crisis, mm. What we do is, or any other crisis, uh, I mean, personal, collective, uh, group, uh, work, uh, wherever, you present yourself to yourself. Because when when the context change a lot, mm. th- this is a very central part of, of, of uh, when you work with change and personal development. Yeah. When the context changes, yeah. your old clothes doesn't suit anymore. Mm. They don't fit. No, No, they don't fit because it's raining, mm-hmm. and they are unsuitable for the rain. Yeah, you know. So, so I think that crisis is a very good thing, and <coughs> I spent a day in at a <coughs> hospice in in Rotterdam, and and um, the woman who was fully employed there, she said that. Uh, the the easier thing for for the people who came in uh, was to to uh, who's who's going to get what when I'm gone, uh, but the important thing was uh, to sort out the relationships that were very important. Yeah, and that's that is our basic one of the basic problems we have mm. in life relationships. Yeah. And that's why we have all these religious views on science or psychology or uh, I'm into cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm. We have all the answers. No, I'm into gestalt. We have all the answers. No, I'm into positive psychotherapy. Yeah. We have all the answers, etc., yeah. <laughs> etc. Et yeah. No, I'm into <laughs> psychoanalysis. We have known this since the very yeah. beginning. Yeah. You know. And it's it's a, a very reductionistic view, mm. <laughs> and it's all my, it's it's like a religion. It's a strong belief, mm. a very strong belief, and um, people uh, feel nice about that. Mm. We don't like change. We don't like ambivalence, mm. uh, particularly not in the materialistic world. You should be strong and have an ego, and we talk about pre-ambivalent and post-ambivalent faces. Mm. And if you're pre-ambivalent, you're just a child knowing nothing, mm. you know? Mm. <laughs> and that's bullshit. Yeah. It's a very creative thing to be 
to not know. Yes, that's that's the most creative state yeah, to yeah, be in. Yeah, yeah. I love since since a teenager. I think I was thirteen, first time I read about Zen Buddhism, mm. and they have this concept of beginner's mind. Yeah. So did Jesus. Yeah. Be like a child. Yes. So has every re- religion or every culture, yeah. not religion, uh, but every culture I've seen so far, uh, have this idea. Open your eyes if you want to see reality. Otherwise, you see yourself. Mm. And this is not easy, my friend. Yeah. This is very, very difficult. It takes practice. It takes honesty. It takes self-criticism, etc. And maybe not take things so seriously. Take it a little bit. See the see life as a stage play in a way, and that it's fun to play yeah. with it. Shakespeare wrote about that. Yes. life is a stage. <laughs> well, he wrote all these stage <laughs> plays, and and he was he was just to the point so often. I think he he got it all right. You know, he knew a lot of things about the human nature. But <coughs> yeah, you want to add something I, um, on that, or or no. I can just continue my yeah. question here. Yeah. Uh, I was going to mention uh, what well, you, you you talked about uh, a child's mind, mm-hmm. and I listened to uh, an interesting spiritual teacher. I guess you can call him Richard Rudd, who has uh, a concept he calls the gene keys. I don't know much about it, but I, I heard him uh, in a video talk about uh, overwhelm and how uh, grown-ups in in this uh, materialistic and and uh, uh, stressful world get overwhelmed bec- when they have so much to do and they kind of take it very seriously and they almost panic uh, when they think of the possibility that, that they might forget something they have to do all all the things on the list and otherwise they or otherwise they're they're it's a disaster but then but Richard Rudd said that uh, look at a child who doesn't know anything a four or five year old child uh, in, in a playing yard um, uh, th- like you said, they don't know anything about anything, and there are so many things happening around them, and they just play with it. They don't get overwhelmed. I mean, no. you can look how they move from one activity to the other. They put some sand in their mouth, and they th- realize that doesn't taste good. And then there's a bird in the sky, and look at that. And then there's something to play with on the ground. Mm. And then there's a, a friend coming, and then m- mom is shouting to them because dinner is ready. And there's things happening all the time. They don't get overwhelmed. No, they haven't. We haven't taught them yet that they need a strong ego. Exactly. And need to be opposed, ambivalent, and need to know exactly what to do in the next moment, and to be a perfect person. And mm. if you're not a perfect person, there's something wrong with you. Mm. And we can help you being more perfect. Perfection is a big problem today. Perfection and and also the the uh, wish to be perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If I, I don't believe in perfection, because otherwise science would be at the end of the road, and the science is not at the end of the road. <laughs> There's still some things in the universe we haven't discovered yet, you and we so? haven't <laughs> understood. <laughs> For yeah. example, the planet, the human being, the climate change. Oh, details like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, how uh, talking about now the uh, the the uh, the. Um, interaction between people and individuals versus groups and and so on as which you have been working <coughs> with so much in your in your professional life um, we are at the core creative beings so if you want to create we we, ha- we have to interact and how how would you describe the relationship between the individual and the and the collective if there is a, an easy way to describe it yeah i mean from the materialistic point of view the relative self, the, the the society we live in today, with a strong ego and post ambivalence and uh, stages and steps and stuff like that, uh, we have come to think that there are stages in a group process, and as such, they take away the individual, they take away the relationships and stuff like that. So the the stage they are in will describe the relationship. And of course, that's bull. Mm. Because everything comes from inside us out. Everything. Mm, mm. Even relationship. Mm. You and I have this relationship now here. Mm. And it you coming out towards me mm. and I coming out towards you. 
and we both are aware of that camera and people are watching us and stuff like that. But the group process is actually the relationships between the individuals. So there is no such thing as steps or stages. Mm. It's a soup. Yeah. It's a soup. That's yeah, I prefer fish soup. I don't eat meat. It's a quantum soup, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, maybe quantum soup. It's definitely soup. Some lots of things is swimming around, you know, yeah. in this bowl, and and it's definitely not a, stairs in there. You can't find any stairs in the soup. But some people, some people talk about the collective or groups, different t- types of groups and collectives, and, and uh, collective entities as if they were really entities, I mean, if they were real things, and they put so much emph- emphasis and so much importance to these entities as, you know, nations or yeah, football yeah. teams yeah. or families or <coughs> and, and, and clans in some countries. The clan is so important that, that people e- almost seem to forget that they are individuals. They have to work for the, for the clan or for the collective or for yeah. the mafia, for yeah. the whatever. So what do you think about th- these notions around certain collective entities? They exist on the relative side of the egos, of course, because we are a social being. And if you look at the newborn child and the mother, you realize that this newborn child and the mother wouldn't survive if there wasn't a society around it to take to care of them protect them, give them food, etc. So, of course, <clears throat> from one perspective, on this materialistic side, where we are physical beings, mm. we are certainly a part of, of this group, and we certainly, there's really something into social psychology and uh, this, um, our evolutionary background and all that stuff. But that's not the whole picture. Mm. But there's nothing wrong with it for the moment, so to speak, before we we realize new things which we have to squeeze into that picture. Mm. <clears throat> but I mean, if you see it from an energetic point of view, from from a uh, bigger pardon, energetic, energetic energy, okay. yes, energy I understand. point of yes. view. Mm. I asked. Uh, uh, I was in a pub with a professor in physics, and I asked him. <coughs> From the perspective of Rupert Sheldrake, for example, yeah. um, um, what would happen if we found that energy and could measure it that could explain why I understand you without we talking to each other? Yeah, Nobel Prize. <laughs> it's a Nobel Prize <laughs> for him as a physicist. Of yeah, course, yeah. this we don't have found the last energy, yeah. you know. Yeah. Of course there will be more than energies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Well, why maybe not? Maybe one of these can explain how we have this projection of, of thought. Mm. And in psychotherapy, even in materialistic people, yeah. we talk about um, uh, projective identification. Somehow, you as a client put some emotional stuff into mm. me mm. energy whatever yeah and i that's unconscious for me that process is unconscious for me as a therapist so i i identify this feeling i have now that you just put into me mm. as me mm. me ego mm. and from that perspective i can help you develop personally. Mm. And that's called projective identification. And I asked I asked many, many people, many psychotherapists during the years, is this energy? Mm-hmm. How do you explain how this happens? Yeah. Well, it's just that, uh, you know, it's an emotion. Yeah, but what is an emotion? Exactly. Why is this happening? Yeah, yeah. What's the meaning with the whole thing? Yeah. You know? But we, we can't answer that question with energy yet. They can say that well, it's an evolutionary advantage to have that uh, ability. Yeah, yeah. But but that doesn't answer the question anyway. No, no. Because it must be something. Where does it come from? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's interesting. But I mean, if you talk to a hunt, hunting team uh, a thousand years ago, they knew exactly what to do without talking to each other. Mm. And yeah. it was wasn't only training. Of course, one thing was training. Mm. 
uh, taught by s- since they, they were small children. Yeah. But I don't think that's, that's the only thing. As a teenager, my, my friends and I were, was in a movie. Uh, no, we were in a cinema. <laughs> <laughs> you were acting as, in a movie. There's a border there which we can't yeah, yeah, deny, yeah. <laughs> can we? Yeah. Anyway. The world of concepts. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I asked them to, let's focus that guy over there with a the gray coat mm. in the back of his neck yeah, yeah. and make him turn his head yeah. towards us. Yeah. And it took us, and they all agreed to, to do this experiment. I mean, we were 14, I think. Okay. And, and it took about, uh, maybe I remember wrong, but it took about two minutes. And then he turned yeah. around, he could feel it. Yeah. And what is that? I know Rupert ask, Sheldrake ask talks Rupert. about this. <laughs> Rupert Sheldrake talks about this. It's, it, yeah. yeah, I can recommend, listen to Rupert Sheldrake. Ten myths. Ten, what, what's his book called? Uh, man, he has written many books. Yeah, but the one with the number ten in it. Uh, 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 ten oh, being scientific. Being stare at. Yeah, but ten. Ten uh, scientific myths or something. Or anyway. Mm. Uh, that's fascinating, and and we all know. Us, I mean, even materialistic people, they kind of recognize this. They know that that it exists. They yeah, will. Yeah. But. It's so common that we don't even reflect on it. I mean, we don't even think about it. No. That it must be something. It must be something. Yeah. And yeah. his books on dogs. I mean, most dog owners yes. uh, who I know, uh, including myself, yeah. have r- seen this. Yeah. They know that when you're coming home, yeah. uh, long before you're, you can yeah. be seen it, or heard. And uh, the interesting thing, uh, if I remember right, um, what he came up with was during his research, because this is research, mm. was that um, it was when the intention was created in the owner of the dog. Then the dog, okay, oh, yeah, yeah. now she or he is coming yeah. and went to the favorite place to sit yeah. where she, the dog could, could watch uh, when the owner came home. Yeah. And I knew I, I had my office in Växjö. Mm-hmm. I had my office on the ground floor in the house. Yeah. And when Caesar, my dog, came out, came down and sat on a certain place where he could look out the window, I knew, okay, my wife is coming home soon. Okay. And it was always true. Yeah, it was always, it was always like true. Yeah. Sometimes it took um, half an hour, sometimes uh, one hour. But, but it, it certainly was when the intention, I checked this with mm. my watch. Mm and talk to her and it certainly was when the inten- her intention come okay let's finish off for the day I go and then now. the dog rea- yeah, yeah, realized that oh yeah. she's coming approximately he, he at that time this was happening yeah. that's fascinating yeah it is yeah when will science recognize this as a fact as a scientific fact because I mean the border between science and what we call spirituality must be uh, must be abolished at some point yeah and I, again this spi- word spirituality is also connected to religion so I prefer consciousness uh, yeah or what what about metaphysics what do you think about that term? yeah that's okay that's okay yeah, yeah. Met- yeah. we yeah. have meta levels yeah uh, you know so meta is fine so this thing about us being, in a way, uh, one, I mean, I am you and you are me in this conversation, for instance, mm-hmm. uh, means that we are all connected and uh, maybe there is some kind of a unified field, as they're talking about, and, uh, and this, uh, this uh, um, idea that we are separated is an illusion. But then we organize ourselves in, in, in groups and we have all these these formalistic organizations all over the society. I would say they are part of the <laughs> matrix. I, I often talk about the matrix. Um, I, I don't think many, everybody l- likes that, but I think it's it's telling in a way. But there are so many organizations. There's organizations at workplaces, in, in, in what we call organizations, and in um, uh, sports clubs and, 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 and whatever. How can we... Are we, organize, are, are we organizing ourselves in the best of ways or could we do it better? And do we even need to formally organize, our, organize ourselves or is there, is there such a thing as natural organization? If we were more ourselves, would we, so to speak, uh, naturally or spontaneously form organizations with leaders, 
and informal leaders and all that. That was many questions. I know. However, <laughs> the last one. Take the last one first. Yeah, is the most important one. In, in organizational theory, we call that um, informal organization. And that is the operational organization. Mm -hmm. That is that we, as a management consultant, I've seen this for 25 years, and that's the most important organization. The 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 uh, the organizational plan is just a paper. Yeah. Maybe it's something on the web also <laughs> today. But the real organization, I mean, yeah. who is the manager leaning against when he wants to? make a difficult decision, who has a relationship with whom, uh, who have a, 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 I mean, it's it's all about relationships. And where are the conflicts? Mm. They're important. Where there are conflicts, the quality of the work w is suboptimal. Mm. And also when, when, for example, in in industry, when, when the thing they're producing is leaving one hand going to the other, that's the crucial part for quality. And it's very important to realize if, if you want to raise your, your quality in your product, the physical, uh, materialistic product, mm. to really, uh, really go deep in, uh, in your analysis about when it's leaving one hand to the other, metaphorically. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's the point to, to work on. So the connection point between individuals in the yeah, organization yeah. And, and, and how that works and if it's smooth or not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, lo loving, would you use the word love? Is that, is that a word you use in your management books? No, I talk about it. Yeah. And, uh, I think we're too I, afraid to talk about that, actually. Uh, not all. Uh, th th there was one during the Iraqi war, there was a general, American general, uh, I forgot his name. He was in charge of, of all the American soldiers down there. Mm. And uh, I met a guy who had met him, who was also an officer in the military, in the Swedish military system. Okay. And he asked this very famous guy, if you could give, you, if you could only give one advice to young officer, what would that be? And the answer came immediately, love your soldiers. Mm. If you do that, there's no problem. Mm. That's a good answer. Yeah. I Sit on them, kick them, shit on them, spit <laughs> on them. doesn't work. We know that. We know that. We learned that during the Second World War. Mm. The authoritarian officers were shot from behind yeah. by their own. Mm. And it was repeated in the Vietnam War. Mm. And after that, the, the military changed a lot in the leadership. Mm. It's it's relationships, as you say, and, and love, and I, I think Americans, by the way, are uh, ha, are more prone to using the the word love uh, in different contexts than than we in Sweden and, and or in Europe are. But that's a side sidetrack. Um, have you read the Rut Rutger Bregman's book Humankind? No, I got it, but I haven't yeah, read it. Before. It's called uh, Humankind in English and in Swedish. It's uh, Igrund and Good, I think, the translation. Yeah. It's a brilliant book. You should really read it. And and he talks about, in in one or two chapters there, he talks about these uh, things about military and, I mean, the the general general idea of the book is that 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 humans are, at at the core, uh, kind and and want to do good things and and want want to want to love and all that and and uh, this narrative that we would be completely chaotic and selfish and ruthless if there wasn't a structure to hold us back is false in in his in his uh, mm. reasoning there and then there there are some people who say but 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 what about wars i mean these these war machines and the, the the germans during the nazi years for instance they they continued fighting even long after it was obvious that the germans were going to lose the war but the the soldiers just kept on fighting wasn't it because they were duped by the by the leaders and uh, and that they didn't think about love and all those things. But then he said, I mean, I can't remember exactly the the reasoning here, but uh, but it was something like um, what you were saying here, that the main thing was the loyalty and the love for their comrades, their uh, their fellow 
soldiers, their mm. fellow fighters. Mm -hmm. It was so, so strong that they, it, it's been studied afterwards. They, they, there have been interviews, uh, deep interviews done, made by these, uh, with these uh, soldiers that survived and, um, and, and lived in Germany afterwards. And they said, uh, they have almost all witnessed that they, they, they knew that they were going to lose, but uh, it didn't matter to them because they couldn't leave their, their comrades. They just mm. couldn't leave them. No. They had to, if, if, if my comrades are going to die, I will die with them. So they didn't really think about the ideology or what the leaders in Berlin were saying or mm. anything like that. Mm. So it uh, corroborates <laughs> what yeah, you were yeah, saying. Yeah. Okay, so, um, uh, w so would you say that, that the informal uh, group, the informal organization is 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 the better one or is the the natural one that we should actually go for if we had to choose well uh, it's a complicated question because we also live in a society with laws and traditions and uh, responsibility borders of responsibility etc cetera, etc cetera. and this means that we need we also need this organizational diagram mm. But it's not the, it's not the working organization in in many ways. Uh, it's not the thinking. It's not the creative organization in many ways, etc. So we we need to balance these two. It's like the relative self and the absolute self. Mm. I mean, well, 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 why have uh, it at, at all? Why have these uh, formal structures? What's what's the point? Le uh, many times it's, it's a legal structure. Yeah, so we'll get rid of that then. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't do that. It's very difficult in a society to, to be without Well, laws. we can do anything. We are creative. No, things. we can't do anything. If we want, we can change things if we want to. Oh, no. <laughs> I've been working with people for many years and Freud and his, uh, his daughter uh, talked very much about the resistance to change. And the resistance to change is very obvious for anyone working with personal development, group development, organizational development, scientific development, whatever change is going on. Mm. It's always a part of the process which is resistance. Yeah. And that is a very good thing because and, and, and <coughs> I think it's easy to, to find some kind of reason for this, a meaning. Uh, it's, a, it's a great meaning in resistance. Because without resistance, there's no change. There's just obedience. And that doesn't create change. That's true. Nothing happens. That's oh, yes, I will do that. Nothing happens. Oh, yes, I will do that. Mm. Nothing happens. No, I don't want to do that. Why not? Because it's so idiotic to do that. Why? <laughs> you know, and they have contact mm -hmm. and they start to discuss things. <coughs> and for every I piece of information that comes into this person who have all this resistance, mm. yeah, the whole creative process starts. Yeah. From the body to the brain, back to the body, you know, this o organismic movement, mm. which is creativity communication, etc., starts. But if you say, oh, yes, I will do that. Mm. Nothing happens. N nothing happens because I don't know what to do. Mm. That's but very because, well put. Because of my resistance, I understand what the guy is meaning. And then I can ask, but is that a good thing? Oh, yes, because why? And that's a creative discussion. Authoritarian leadership is a disaster mm. from this point of view. So they don't believe in human beings. <laughs> they believe in machines, which in terms, of course, is a part of a materialistic yeah. worldview, you know. Yeah. We they, are machines. They believe in this Excel doc document yeah, where you yeah, have everything yeah, in a matrix. Yeah. And everything in the personality is up here. Mm. It's just it's just by chance. It's epiphenomenal. It's just chemical reactions behind the forehead. You're nothing, you mm. idiot. You're just a chance. Flesh robots. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it makes sense what you say about the creative process. It's, it's, it's good, well put. 
I must say. Uh, when I did one of my, I, I did um, together with Rolf Wikström, producer, uh, radio producer, we did uh, a couple of series about creativity. Mm. And I remember I was interviewing one of the top uh, inventors in Sweden. And he talked about his, his, when his pregnant face, mm -hmm. you know, when the ideas came, etc. Yeah. And then when he was going to deliver the baby, so to speak, he was very antisocial. His his wife didn't want him at home, so <laughs> 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 he bought some sausages, folly sausages, yeah, yeah. you know, a big. A big solid sausage, sausages, and and uh, bread, and went out to to the summer house, mm. and then he had this, as he explained it, very emotional, painful experience of delivering the <laughs> baby, <Yeah. laughs> and maybe it was just a, a sketch or just a few words. It wasn't, you know, this is. Uh, a new structure for a no. robot. It no. wasn't something like that. It was just the small things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it was really a baby. It mm -hmm. wasn't a, an invention. Mm. It was a baby. An embryo. Yeah. Embryo to invention, yeah. I think many <laughs> authors, many writers can recognize that yeah, yeah, image yeah. also, yeah, that yeah. metaphor, <laughs> delivering a baby. Yeah. So this is being human. This is being human, yeah. yeah. You have to accept that because we can't be something else. And the the, the creation, creative process comes from the clash between uh, somebody wanting to change and, and 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 another party not wanting to change. And in that in that clash, there is creation because it, you start talking about, as you say, why and why not, and then you have maybe a compromise or you come to something, some different conclusion. So so yeah. that one plus one uh, makes three or five. <laughs> all of a sudden or five or whatever. Yeah. Or like, or 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 a peach, yeah, or a peach exactly. An apple no, and a banana no, is a peach. Oh, it's a peach. <laughs> yeah, it's not five. <laughs> it's not a five. Why it's not? a peach. <laughs> Shall we share it? <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. I love it. That's a good thing. But also uh, another another part of the question about change, as you say, it's good. It's a good thing that some people don't want to change. But another aspect of that is that 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 that, that and this is almost the title of your book, that change is the only constant in a way B because everything changes we can see i mean if we look back in time whatever time is but if we do that the history that we have on on, on this planet we can see that things don't look the same they did 50 years ago and they don't work the same thing no. the same way and people don't behave the same way so nothing is nothing is constant and some people are more uh, prone to accept that or even embrace this and uh, have fun with that and some people are, are almost uh, you know they almost feel agony when they think that nothing's going to st stay the same forever it, be it in their own personal life if they get get a divorce and children grow up or whatever or it's their nation which suddenly is uh, filled with foreigners that you didn't do, that weren't here when I was young and it doesn't look the way it did when I was young and so how can people learn to embrace to live with the fact that nothing on this earth is constant in that in that respect we can't because if we accepted it i mean from an evolutionary point of view if we had accepted it we wouldn't survive as a, as a race, as a human being, as a dogs, as a fishes, or whatever. Nor even a amoeba wouldn't have survived. So every change has a possibility of being a danger. Mm. And we have to handle that. So the change comes, the positive change comes from the dynamic between not wanting to change and and this constant strife. What is it that is pulling us to change, do you think? I well, think the future is pulling us, but I don't know what the future is, but <laughs> I don't know, no. I haven't the slightest I, idea. You don't think that there are, there are a, a, a myriad possibilities in, in the quantum soup, uh, myriad possibilities of, of, of a future that we can have or could have, depending on what paths we choose? 
But that sounds more like a cognitive idea than the real drive. Mm. Yeah, true. Uh, I mean, it's it's. I think it's like sexuality, hunger, thirst. Uh, it's it's a drive, you know, in the from the if you use a psychological word. Mm. And I, i strongly believe as I learned in the sixties. As a, as a teenager in humanistic psychology that wanting new knowledge is also a drive mm. because we can't have an evolution uh, without a drive for new knowledge, new behavior, new things, new whatever, new handling of uh, wood, stone. Uh, I mean, the, the first stone tool two and a half million years ago I think they found two and a half million yeah years yeah ago. it's mm-hmm. it's a long time ago uh, it's it's something happens there and they they didn't have our brains and and our knowledge they had brains etc but not our knowledge but they had this drive and the question which they probably probably couldn't verbalized how can I use this stone in different ways so I guess like many inventions and, and, and many new scientific uh, ideas came out of mistakes. Mm. But someone saw it. And they, in that moment, the, the, not a question in, in verbalizing, but in that moment, the drive for understanding, see meaning and usage uh, starts. Mm. So this is this is. I mean, birds have it. Uh, so it's been around for quite some time. Yeah. <laughs> so it must be it must be a part of nature, like uh, like the yeah. sun going around uh, the planet, and and we, uh, uh, you know, we came up, and no, the, we can't see it that way. Mm. And the whole the whole worldview changed. Uh, now your concept of choice uh, for all these non-materialistic things is consciousness. You've you've been mentioning consciousness mm. a lot. Uh, what is consciousness in your view? Thirty seconds. Thirty <laughs> seconds. No, you can use it. I hope. Seconds. I hope that during my death process, I will understand that. Mm. Until then, I have to wait. But you have some general idea. Yeah, I mean, I have, <laughs> <laughs> of course, I have fantasies, yeah. so, you know, comforting fantasies about it. But to say that I that I have any knowledge about it, except that moment, which was my body, or well, I have had it since, but when I had this body experience of 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 all is one. Yeah. Uh, it is something which cannot be talked about in terms of verbalizing knowledge. Mm. Like when we're talking about, shall we put water into the glass, or mm. uh, how long shall we have this talk, mm. you and me, etc. Mm. Mm. So it's outside our regular position mentally. Yeah, And it's something which is collective at the same time individual so we can't understand it really i think but it's not placed in the brain that's for sure no 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 it's not placed in so the what's the brain in your view hmm. how would you describe the function of the brain it's more like i mean this is this is a very simplistic answer but it's more like the radio mm. The, 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 the program radio, imagine, is yeah. not sent from the radio, but we certainly need the radio mm. to hear the music mm. and to enjoy the music and to experience the music and to find new kind of music, etc., 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 new instruments mm. and maybe get an idea of I want to play the flute or whatever. I mean, so many things can happen, you know, when you start to use your brain. It's a fantastic tool. Mm. Uh, it's course, enormous, yeah. Yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And we're just in the beginning, I think, to understand it. But we are, we, I think we are uh, perhaps um, overvaluing the brain in the Western world 
uh, in comparison with other organs like the, the heart. I was thinking mainly of the heart. I think yeah. we have undervalued the heart. Well, I don't know much about this, but I, I read read about some some research around these things. Uh, there's an institute in California called called the Heart Heart Math Institute. Mm. You might yeah. be yeah. Yeah. aware of that, yeah. and they do some interesting studies on. You, you were mentioning before that dogs can sense that when the owner is coming home and all that. And I, I think, as far as I understand, these experiments that they've done at the the Heart Math Institute uh, show that uh, if you let people look at different images, for instance, which are some of them are graphic and and, and uh, violent, for instance, and some are beautiful and soothing and calming. And it there is a there is a uh, an electrical signal from the heart before there is a signal in the brain, which tells the pupils, for instance, the pupils in the eyes to, to yeah. close or open, yeah. uh, depending on what kind of picture image they're watching, which indicates that the heart knows before the brain. And so, so what is that? I mean, th- then, then, then it's not the, it's not the vision itself that tells the brain to do something. It's it's something else in you. It's something more diffuse, metaphysic metaphysical or, or whatever yeah and probably uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there was signals also from the enteric nervous system could be the the gut brain sometimes it's called oh, yeah but uh, as we have all like one of my favorites when I was young was Eric Jansch the self-organizing universe and of course if we all come out of the same from the same place which we see as a kind of New Year's Eve, the Big Bang. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. Yes, yes. <laughs> it must be a bang if yeah, something yeah. big is happening, and a big one, of course. The big poof. <laughs> <laughs> the, we did. We can't say it's a fart. It was a no, fart. The big fart. <laughs> no. No. So it must be a big bang. But yeah. anyway, uh, we, if if there's something to that, mm. uh, we come all from the same. From the same beginning, beginning we have all the yeah, same beginning. Yeah. We're all star seeds. Yeah, so we th- there must be something in this evolutionary thinking, maybe not exactly as we have thought it it has been, mm-hmm. but there's something in in a development that is called in philosophy. Mm. Everything is dependent on everything. Yeah. Like the the Finnish guy, Jörg Henrik von Wricht, who, yep. who got the chair Philosopher. after Wittgenstein, he he writes this somewhere. Everything is dependent on everything, and well, that's uh, quantum and that's physics. A, yeah, really. and it's a Buddhist th- also in interdependency they call yes. it. Yeah. So we see some things coming uh, from all kinds of cultures mm-hmm. and meaning. If we can ask for meaning, which the materialistic science don't like me. <laughs> they want to know how. Mm. <laughs> it's all pointless, but I want to know how. But yeah. why? If it's pointless, why do you want to know how? Exactly. But that was Russell's big, I think, I may be, I'm, I'm not. Paradox. Uh, yeah. Why shouldn't we go and buy a rope? Everything is meaningless. Yeah, yeah. And the whole cosmos will go down eventually. Yeah. So why don't we go and buy us a rope? Yeah. Uh, well, that's the only <laughs> viable question, actually. Yeah, yeah. The only philosophical question you need to ask yourself. Yeah, but we don't do that because no. we know it's a meaning in the, everything. I, uh, the, the default feeling in, in small children, for instance, is that there is meaning, of course. Yeah, and yeah. then they're talked out of it yeah, yeah. at some point. Yeah. yeah, we should go back to that childish state. Okay, so uh, this has been really <laughs> fascinating. Um, just briefly, a uh, s- couple of small matters uh, towards the end here. Where is God? Uh, where <laughs> is God? Yes, exactly. That's, that's the question. I, I, yeah, I haven't dared to ask any of my other guests, but you're one of the first persons. Is he under, beneath, underneath <laughs> the table, perhaps, or in the glass? Hmm. Why he? Maybe she. It. She, yeah, yeah. yeah. But w- just talk a little bit about the what I call the, the matrix, uh, the society. Are structures? Are you? Many people talk about the chaos that is ensuing out out there, and it's a bit of a uh, I wouldn't say meme, but to say that it's chaotic is very common. It's almost mainstream to say that it's chaotic out there. 
But it does look a bit chaotic, especially during this pandemic and all that. And there are a lot of things happening, and not least because of the the uh, the barrage of information that we are swimming in. But do you think? Do you see this society now, this planet, this world as a place where things are coming to? Some things are coming to an end. It, it's kind of a crunch time that structures are falling, or is it just overblown? Is it just exaggerated? Well. That's a question. That's a big question. <laughs> yeah. I was. I just said. It's, but, and, apart from the God <laughs> question, this is the second biggest one. Yeah, and of course, from that, in my head, what comes up is the climate mm-hmm. problem, and that can be the end of us. I, I'm sure. But you buy into that completely. That uh, narrative. Yeah, more or less. Yeah. And I read today in the newspaper that from his southern Sweden, they don't have bumblebees. And this gardener said, this year I only seen one bumblebee. Mm. And of course... I've wh- seen a lot of bumblebees yeah, here but in, not, in Stockholm. Not, yeah, but not down there. Okay. And what will happen if if we don't have um, pollinating or whatever that is in Pollinating, English. perhaps? Pollinating, yeah. yeah. I, if we don't have all these animals who can pollinate, what will happen? Yeah, well... Well, well, we don't, wouldn't want that, of course. And there have been a lot of environmental problems all along, and some we've been we've solved or we've uh, uh, mitigated or eased uh, over the course of the years. I think human beings, when we see the problems and realize them, we do something about it uh, about them. Yeah, and we want to do it through technical stuff. Uh, many years ago, when I left, before I left the Umeå and started with my I- first internship mm. in Växjö, mm. uh, I organized together with a friend uh, a workshop with Rolling Thunder. Uh, it was one of the first uh, North American Indian shamans who, who talked to the Western mm. people. Mm. Um, anyway, he, he came up with his, with his uh, roadies and... Uh, uh, we had out in the forests uh, in in northern Sweden. We we had a a tippy a, yeah, yeah. a tippy camp, and um, for him, and and as I was studying medicine, or just newly finished my medical school, uh, he he accepted to have a special session with me, and it was very very interesting because. He, Roland Thunder is a known guy, mm. R.T. Mm. People mm. believe they know him, call him R.T. But his way of seeing at, at things, at nature, etc., wasn't that he was outside of it. He was definitely uh, inside mm. and definitely uh, he was part of nature. Mm. Mm. And of course, if you were a part of nature, you don't take an axe and... and uh, no, why would you want to hurt yourself? Yeah, why would you hurt yourself, you know? Yeah, I, And that's what the year Henrik von Richt also, I think, yeah. came very close to. Yeah. Everything is dependent on everything. Mm, mm. All is one. Mm. I think we, we might be closer to the, that kind of realization. I, I've been pondering a lot this, the fact that, and, and that's also one of the bases for this podcast, Mind the Shift, is that the world is integrating or humanity is integrating for the first time in recorded history. I mean, we might have been, there might have been civilizations hundreds of thousands of years ago that we don't know about today that have have, uh, ceased to be. But as as far as we know, this is the first time in recorded history that humankind is integrating, truly integrating. So we know everything that's happening on the other side of the planet in real time, all the time. And this, I think, does things to us. Yes. It makes us uh, conscious about things. Yeah. So I I think it's mainly positive, but it also makes it a bit messy. And frightening, I think. Yeah, but we shouldn't be afraid because that's our biggest enemy. Of course. But still, people get afraid. I know. You can it's see the amygdala, it. and it's it's very S- active. Stop reading the news. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no. But we need, I think, maybe other kinds of politicians. Yeah, we don't need Donald Trump. Uh, no, we need other kind of politicians who can have this inclusive way of seeing it, at things. You know, or self-organize, not having politicians at all. In the far future, in the yeah, yeah, yeah. distant future. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We won't solve that now. <laughs>
Anyway, it's been a fun talk and a very interesting talk, Bo Arenfeld. Thank you, and, and good luck with your with your institute there. We didn't talk about that, but good luck with that and your books and your cross-border endeavor. Thank you.